Well, hello everybody. So today's going to be a little bit different in terms of the way that we approach class. Um, now you're coming to understand that, that we, we not only talk about context in this class, but we also talk about the way that we interact with material. Sometimes it's teacher directed, sometimes it's student led. But guys, today's going to be a little different simply because there are some fundamental skills and techniques that you need to be able to do in order to be successful in lab. So how does this tie together? Well, last time in class, you, uh, you gathered in lab and also in the classroom, and we talked about lab safety, we talked about first aid, we talked about the things that you need to be able to understand and do in order to be safe. Today, what we're going to do is introduce you to some skills and some techniques and some concepts and some calculations that you're going to need to be able to carry out in order to be a successful student in lab. Now guys, what you're going to see is today we're going to introduce you to a fair amount of material. That's why we're recording this, because we want you to have the opportunity, we want everybody to have the same opportunity to consistent information. Then what you're going to see is next time in class, we're actually going to go to lab. And guys, understand our expectations in lab are not for you to do this perfectly. Our expectations uh, of you next time in lab are that you're taking the ideas that you learned today, you're acting safely, as we talked about last time, and you're inviting yourself to learn and experiment and try these things out in lab as we start working in lab. Um, next time. So you should have in front of you a copy of what we call guided notes. Um, this is a lot of information coming quickly and so as a result uh, we gave you the skeleton of the notes and frankly all you need to do is fill in the blanks. What's then going to happen is your class notes will become a terrific resource for when we go in to lab next time. So this is the way we're going to handle this. We're going to talk skills, techniques, concepts, calculations, and we're going to start with skills. So as you see in the guided notes in front of you, there are some lab equipment that you need to be able to skillfully use. The first one of those is a Bunsen burner. And so off to the right there in your notes and on the screen, you see what a properly lit Bunsen burner looks like. So then the question is, how do you do that successfully? And so guys, in order to properly light a Bunsen burner, the steps go like this. Please fill in the blanks as we go. Uh -oh. So the first thing that you're going to do in order to successfully light your Bunsen burner is you're going to shut the Bunsen burner down. I'll show you more about what that means in a minute, but that is your first step in terms of doing this well. Then step number two is to turn on the gas. Again, I'll demonstrate this in a second. Right now we're just filling out our notes. Once you've done that, you will then open the needle valve on your burner, which will then allow the gas to flow. At this point, you'll light the burner, but what you're going to find out is that the flame is not an efficient flame. So then you will adjust the flame, and the valve adjusts the height of the flame, the barrel adjusts the heat of the flame. At that point, we'll then bring in a ring stand and show you how to marry the two together, and then when you're done, you will shut off the gas at the valve, and I'm sorry, at the, well, at this valve, rather than the valve that's on the Bunsen burner. Okay, so bringing these ideas together, this is the first skill that you need to possess um, as a result of today's time together. So this is what this looks like. In our labs, we have Bunsen burner gas um, taps. And the way that this works is anytime the handle is per or perpendicular to the nozzle, it's off. So this is off. Can you see that okay? Yep. And this is off. But when they're aligned parallel, this is on. And you may be able to hear the gas flow. We're going to shut that off for right now, just so we don't fill the room with gas. But here's what you're first going to do. And guys, please do not be hesitant to handle these burners. Pick them up. Be careful if they're hot, but pick up the burner. And to shut down the burner, what you're going to do is you're going to screw the needle valve all the way shut. And then you'll notice down here at the bottom of the burner, there are, can you see the vents? Yeah. 
You'll, you, there are vents here that are currently open, and you will turn this metal sleeve so that the vents are closed. This is now a shutdown burn. At that point, as I showed you before, you will turn on the gas, and at that point, it's time to light the Bunsen burner. Now, we do not use matches to light the burners because then we end up with matches in the trash. And that causes problems. So we're going to use a striker to light the Bunsen burner. Here's how to do this properly. And guys, seriously, this matters. You're going to take your left hand, not your right. You're going to take your left hand, and you're going to extend your pointer finger and your thumb up into the air, kind of like a gun. Then you're going to take your little gun, and you're going to flip it on its side, and then you are going to rest the hood of the striker against the barrel of your gun. Then you're going to hook your thumb over this leg of the striker. And you're going to push hard enough that it leaves a dent on your thumb. Once you have that all lined up, you then squeeze, and this thing makes sparks. Now understand, if you don't do that, you can squeeze this thing forever, and it will never spark. So again, it's here, squeeze, spark. Okay, so now we're ready to light our burners. Here's what we're going to do. We are going to turn on the gas at the tap, but now our gas is not flowing because the needle valve is closed. Now we're going to open this. And as you do, you can actually hear the gas flowing. Once you've done that, you're going to come to the burner from the side, and you're going to light the Bunsen burner. Now the trick here is that when you light the burner like this, can you see that? The flame Let's try this. How about that? It's a bit better. A bit better. The flame is actually flickering, and that is not a hot, efficient flame. So at this point, we need to adjust the flame, and you do that with the valve and the barrel. And here's how you do that. The first thing that you're going to do is you're going to adjust the height of the flame by using the barrel or by using the valve. And you want to create a flame that's about three inches tall. Once you've done that, we've adjusted the height, but now we need to adjust the heat. And what you're going to do is you're going to grab the outer sleeve around the barrel and you're going to twist it until that flame collapses and you've got a much tighter roaring flame and that flame, ooh, that's hot, is about an inch tall and it actually looks like this where you've got an inner flame and an outer flame and the hottest part of this flame is actually right here at the tip of the inner flame. Now my flame's a little too short so I can come at the barrel or the needle adjustment and I can open this a little bit more, making the flame a little bit taller, and that's the flame that we're looking for. You should hear a roar as you do this. Now, once you're done uh, with that, it's now time to introduce a ring stand. So this will be there at your table as well, but what you want to do is adjust the ring stand prior to trying to use it. So you'll take off the wire gauze, and you will then place the lit Bunsen burner on the ring stand then your goal is to move this ring up and down until the ring is level with the hottest inner blue part of that flame. And then at that point, you reintroduce the wire gauze, and then you're all set and ready to use the burner for heating. Now, when you're done with that, it's now time to shut the burner down. Do not shut the burner down here at the needle valve. These are actually not gas tight in the leak. So when you shut this down, you shut it down here at the tap. Closing that completely shuts off the gas. Please notice that we never use this gas tap to adjust the height of the flame. This is either off or wide open on, and all the adjustments happen here at the Bunsen burner. Is please understand that when you get over to lab next time, this is not as straightforward as, as, as Ms. Call and I can make it appear. Um, you're probably going to struggle with this a little bit. Um, you'll have time in order to work your way through that, but don't be surprised if it's a little harder than you initially expected. And guys, again, as we said, as we get into this, 
come on. When we're ready to shut this down, we shut off the Bunsen burner at the tap. Okay, so now moving down the list, uh, we'll come back to this later. These are also things that we talked about in the measurement activity, so it should be familiar to you, but let's just make sure we're clear. When you are using a digital balance, again, we talked about this, um, you need to understand some important concepts. First of all, this. We never put chemicals directly on the balance. Whether it's a liquid or a solid chemical, we will always use weighing boats to protect our balances. Uh, in addition to that, um, we always zero the balance uh, by hitting the re-zero button. So use the zero button to re-zero the balance or remove the mass of a container. So if we want to measure the mass of something and we need to put it in a weighing boat, we'll place the weighing boat on the balance, we'll hit zero to re-zero the balance, and then we'll uh, weigh the object. Now guys, in addition to this, and again, we've talked about this before, because our balances are digital devices, we do not estimate one decimal place because it's not by comparison. Now, guys, one other important thing to mention before we move past balances, and it's not in your notes, but we need to mention this. Never put hot things on the balance. Um, these balances are very temperature sensitive. The, the, the rule of thumb is this. If you can't touch it, you can't weigh it. And we'll talk more about that when we go to lab next time. Okay, moving along then, we now need to talk about another measurement device. This is what is called a graduated cylinder. You had several of these in your hands um, during the measurement activity. Uh, you measured the length of several graduated cylinders. Because we use graduated cylinders to measure the volume of liquids. And as we do, there are some important ideas that you need to understand. Some of you saw this. As a matter of fact, some of you, we talked about this in the measurement activity. Guys, these are the important things to think of. Some of you saw this in the measurement activity. It's called the meniscus. And it's kind of an interesting little phenomenon. Because what happens is, is when we put liquid in a graduated cylinder, you maybe have heard of capillary action, maybe you've heard of, uh, of intermolecular forces. Well, what happens is the water is actually attracted to the, the, the molecules, if you will, in the glass. And so what happens then is the water is drawn up the sides of the glass. We call that the meniscus. The rule is this. When we measure a volume with a graduated cylinder, we will always measure from the bottom of the meniscus. Never the top. We always measure from the bottom of the meniscus. And so you may want to include that in your notes page. It does mention the definition of meniscus. I would encourage you to write the word bottom next to that so that you understand you always measure from the bottom of the meniscus. Now, in addition to that, there's another important term for you to know when we work with graduated cylinders. And that term is parallax. Parallax is error in measurement that is caused by misalignment. So imagine that I want to measure the volume of this water. We go 30, 40, 50 milliliters. But now guys, the problem is this. If this meter stick represents my vision, if I'm down here, I'm going to be thinking that this volume is greater than it is because I'm reading from low to high. Now similarly, if I'm turned this way, I'm going to be out of alignment because I'm reading from high to low. So how do we then take care of parallax? And guys, there's a couple of things that we can do. I have a preference, but you can decide. Guys, first of all, I know a lot of you when we were over in the measurement activity, and I love that you were doing this, you were sliding this up and down in order to make measurements. This is not a measurement aid. This is actually a bumper. So if the graduated cylinder gets tipped, it doesn't break. It's not meant to be a measurement device. So push that out of the way. And then we've got to figure out what to do about parallax. So guys, there's two things you can do. You can either drop yourself or lift the cylinder. 
I prefer to get down here because now this cylinder is, is stable and I can make an accurate measurement. I find that if I'm doing this, the liquid's moving around, um, I'm still getting rid of parallax, this just isn't my preference. I find I get better measurements if I drop rather than lifting the cylinder. Now, the last thing that we need to talk about is what do we do about estimation? And guys, you should be familiar now with the idea that because this is a analog scale, we will estimate one decimal place past the accuracy of the device. So for example, if we were making this measurement, this is 30, I'm sorry, this is 44, this is 45, measuring from the bottom of the meniscus, I would go like 44.8. The eight is the estimated digit. The units are milliliters, and off we go. All right, so guys, we've now talked about balances. We've talked about Bunsen burners. We've talked about graduated cylinders. We have one more piece of lab equipment that we need to get you familiar with, and it is a filter. Here's how this works. Um, we use filters to separate solids from liquids. This is a piece of filter paper which will eventually go in this funnel. Um, but what we've got to do is figure out how to get this to fit well, because obviously just doing that is not going to work. So in order to get that filter paper to fit well, here's what you're going to do. Oops, come on. All right, here's what you're going to do. These are the steps, and you have these in front of you, but let's go through them one at a time. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to fold this piece of filter paper right in half. Make a half circle. The next thing you're going to do is do that again, and you are going to make a quarter circle. Then what you're going to do is open up pleats one and three. If you look at this on the end, you'll notice that you've got four pleats. Now the trick is if you reach between numbers three, two and three, it just unfolds. So what you've got to do is get your finger in here so that you've got one pleat on one side and three pleats on the other. Once you've got your pleats separated, you are then going to clip the corner of the outer pleat. So we got this dangly thing over here and you are going to rip the corner off of the dangly thing. We'll show you why in a minute. Then at that point, you put this in the funnel and you get it wet. So this will now fit in the funnel, but the problem is, is if you let go, it springs out. So what you're going to do is you will then come over to the sink. You'll put a little bit of water in this, run it around, and then this is now adhering to the, the funnel and you're ready to go. So I know you can't see this, but you will when you do it. The reason that we clip the corner right there is because it actually allows the funnel, the filter paper, to sit flush with the funnel. Then guys, when you are using your funnel, what you want to do is this. Your funnels will actually be supported in your ring stand in this clamp. So what you will do is you will actually take the neck of your funnel and you will slide it through this clamp and that will support it. Then you can pour mixtures of solids and liquids through this. The solids get trapped in the paper, the liquid passes through. You have to be careful though that you don't overfill this because if that mixture gets above the filter paper, it will flow around the paper and you're gonna end up with solids coming through and you're gonna have to do it over. Okay, so this then is the end of all of the skills that we need to talk about. We talked about Bunsen burners, balances, graduated cylinders, and filtering. These are all things that you're going to do in lab next time. Again, guys, the expectation is not that you're perfect, but the expectation is that you're trying intelligently. All right, so now we're going to move on from there, and we're going to talk about techniques. As we talk about techniques, guys, you're going to look at this, and you're going to be like, Seriously, you're going to tell me how to pour stuff? Well, guys, we are. Because the way that we work with um, chemicals in a, in a lab setting is different than just pouring yourself a drink. So how do we do this? 
Well, guys, we're going to talk about dispensing liquids. And as we talk about dispensing liquids, there are some important things that you need to keep in mind. I'm going to show you. I'm sorry. I'm going to, I'm going to give you the notes, and then I'm going to show you what we're talking about. So, guys, first of all, this. Whenever you are pouring, you take the lid off the bottle, and then you palm it. I'll explain. Number two, when you dispense the liquid, you never pour back into the stock bottle. Number three, you will then return the lid to the bottle without setting it down. And then, guys, we will always measure volumes in graduated cylinders. So, guys, let's go through those ideas and let's make them make sense. So, what does all of this mean? Well, first of all, this. Guys, when you get over to lab in a couple, well, next time, you're going to see that there are going to be bottles sitting out around the lab. Let's just grab a couple more just to sort of drive home the point. So, guys, you're going to have bottles sitting out in the lab. And so, say, for example, that you need the contents of this bottle. Well, here's the problem. Imagine that you come up and you grab this, and then somebody comes up and they grab this, and then somebody else comes up and they grab this, and then somebody else comes up and they grab this, and at the end of the day, we got a problem because we don't know which lids go with which bottles, and when we recap these bottles, we could get them wrong and contaminate everything in the bottle. We are not going to put ourselves in that position. If you make this mistake in a college lab, they will just charge you whatever it costs to replace whatever's in the bottle. So how do we avoid the mistake? And it's simply this. Let's get these out of the way and let's focus on one of these bottles. So the way that we avoid making the mistake is this. Say that we need to measure out a volume of this liquid. This is just water. Um, but what we're going to do is this. We're going to take the lid off of the bottle. We are never going to set this lid down. It goes in the palm of our dominant hand. Then you will grab the bottle and you will palm the lid between your hand and the bottle. They never get separated. Then what you're going to do is you're going to pour for yourself whatever volume of this liquid you need. Then you set this down, screw the lid back on the bottle, and then you're done. No cross-contamination. Now, keeping with this idea of contamination, what about this? So say that you get too much of this liquid. If you get too much of this liquid, I know we're thinking conservation, but guys, you never pour back into the stock bottle because this could be dirty, and if you do this, you've just contaminated everybody else's samples. So you never pour back into a stock bottle. So if you're not going to pour back, where does this go? Well, it depends. If it's safe, it goes down the drain, the extra. If it's not safe, it goes in a waste beaker, and then we dispose of it carefully. Then, guys, also this. When we measure volumes in this class, we never use beakers. Beakers are not accurate. They do have lines on the side, but they're, not, they're estimates. They're not meant to be accurate. When we're measuring volumes, we always use graduated cylinders. Okay, so now moving on from there, we need to talk about another process called transferring. Let's go over the notes. So guys, when we're transferring, we'll always use the pipette that is attached to the bottle. The, the way to do that is by squeezing the pipette to bring the liquid up into the bulb. Some of you, when you were at station 15 over in the measurement activity, I came up alongside you and showed you how to do this. Then you dispense the liquid back into the stock bottle, down to the desired amount. Then you squeeze the pipette again to transfer the liquid into a container. Then you put the pipette back. So guys, if you're paying attention, some of you are going to realize that what we just described seems like a contradiction. Let's talk about this. So guys, here's how this goes. When do we transfer? And the answer, frankly, is when we need small volumes. So guys, this graduated cylinder only goes down to 10. So what if we need 2 milliliters of a liquid? Well, guys, we can't measure that on here, so how do we do it? And here's what we do. 
we use what is called a volumetric pipette. You use this at station 15. This very top line is one milliliter. So here's what you do. This pipette will be attached to the bottle. And this pipette has never been anywhere else but in this bottle. So here's what we do. We take off the lid. We don't put it down. Keep it in your hand. Then what you're going to do is you're going to grab the pipette and squish the bulb, stick it in, and slurp it so it's way above the line. Then you're going to pull this out and you are going to drip back into the bottle until this gets the meniscus sits on the line. Once that meniscus sits on the line, you can actually let go of the bulb gently and let this liquid suck back up into the bulb. And now you have one milliliter of this liquid inside the bulb. But you're like, wait a minute. You dripped back into the bottle. Didn't you say never to put back into a stock bottle? And the answer is it's okay right now because this dropper is understood to be clean and only have been in here. So once you've done that, you put the lid back on, and now you've got your milliliter of liquid, and you can take that milliliter of liquid and you can put it wherever you want it, and then you just return this back to the bottle. That is the process of transferring. All right. So again, guys, these are things that we will be doing in lab um, and things that we are going to expect you to be thinking about. Okay, so moving on with this idea of techniques. The next one we need to talk about is weighing and dispensing solids. This is about liquids. Now we need to talk solids. So guys, things to keep in mind. First of all, you will always act in a way to avoid contamination. So we'll talk in a minute. Number two, you never put chemicals directly on a balance. You'll always use a weighing boat. Number three, you will use what we call the tap method to dispense these solids. And again, guys, number three, tap method. Number four, you never pour back into a stock container. You use a spoon and you dispose of the extras, which makes me realize I don't have a spoon. Here we go. Okay. So let's talk about what all of this means. So guys, this is just ordinary table salt. And let's grab a balance. And say, for example, we need to weigh out a gram of salt. How are we going to do this? Well, guys, first of all, we are not going to put the salt on the balance. You understand that salt causes things to rust. You get the idea. So here's what we're going to do. When we approach the balance, we are going to put the weighing boat. You okay? Yep. Should I come up to it, do you think? No, we'll get data later. Okay. Um, you're going to put the weighing boat on the balance, and you're going to turn the balance on. The on and the zero button are the same, and this thing actually self-calibrates. You'll see it count down. And there you go. This reads zero because it has subtracted out the mass of the weighing boat. Now you're going to get a gram of salt. And here's how you're going to do it. I find this is easier if I sort of put my elbows on the table, keeping my clothes off the table because um, the, the countertops are nasty. Mm -hmm. So here's what you're going to do. You are going to load a chemistry spoon or spatula with the salt. And then you're going to hold the spoon or spatula right above. You don't want to like come at this from 30,000 feet. You want to be down here, and then you start to tap. And as you tap, you're going to see the mass go up. And what you're going to do then is you're going to sneak up on this until you get to one gram. Now imagine that you nail it and you get exactly one gram. Where do the extras go? And the answer is not back in here. That's a possible contamination. You're going, wait, you already stuck the spoon in here. That's true, but this is unavoidable. These spoons will be associated with these solids. So it'll go in, but we still don't want to put this back. So if we have extra, it goes in the trash, or if it's dangerous, it goes in a waste container. Now here's the question. What if we get too much? Well, guys, if we get too much, here's what we're going to do. 
We're going to go over to the trash and we're going to get rid of our extra. And then we're going to come back and we're going to pick this up and we're going to take some out. And we took enough out that it now weighs less than a gram and then we're going to tap back up to it so it's exactly a gram and then this goes in the trash. Again, we don't pour back in any case back into a weight into a stock beaker or a stock bottle. So that's the way we will use our balances. Okay, so guys, that's it. We've gone over skills. We've gone over techniques. Now what we need to do is we need to go over some concepts and some calculations. Now guys, this, this concept that we're about to talk about is very important. This is called mass by difference. We just graded, is that true? No. Last time in class when we graded our significant digit homework, uh, we talked about the question of the student weighing sugar on a balance that wasn't accurate. And we learned this interesting idea that if we weigh a container and then put the substance in it and then weigh the container with the substance, like sugar, we can make a broken balance accurate. That has a name. It's called finding mass by difference. These are the important points. As we learned last time, we learned that our masses can be incorrect due to errors in the balance. So we talked about how to overcome this issue so that our masses are correct. Again, the idea, the concept, the principle we learned with the sugar in the beaker. But guys, this is what is called mass by difference, as I said. Just like question, I think it's now question two, right? Yeah. Isn't it? It's question two on the back of the homework. Oh, not that we graded today. Will it be? No, it's the homework that we graded it's, two class periods yes. ago. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So, guys, let me give you an example. Let's find the mass of some salt. So, as we do this, we understand that we could just simply put a weighing boat on the balance, hit zero, put the salt in there, bang, we're done. But guys, that number could be wrong. If this balance is inaccurate, that mass will be wrong. So how do we fix it? And all we do is this. We don't need a weighing boat. We're going to come along and we are going to, um, we are going to find this mass by doing this. We're going to hit zero, and then we are going to weigh the beaker. And guys, I'll just give you the numbers. I would encourage you to write this down. 31.63 grams. So in your data chart, let's record. Oh, switch this. Let's record that mass. And the mass is 31.63. Three. Don't forget units. That's grams. Then um, the next thing that we need to do is we need to add some salt. So let's say we need a gram of salt. So now what we'll do is this. We will pull the beaker off. We will put a weighing boat on there. We'll re-zero the weighing boat. So we want to get a gram. So we're going to sneak up on this so that we're in the ballpark of a gram. Then what we're going to do is we're going to remove this, re-zero this, and then we're going to put the beaker and the salt on the balance. Now here's how to do this. You take your weighing boat and pinch it from the sides and it becomes a pour spout. Don't do this over the balance. You want to do this off to the side, put it in there, and now we weigh again 32.76 grams. All right. So now, guys, I know that some of you are looking at this and you're like, oh, the mass of the salt is 1.13 grams. Yeah. But, guys, the trick is this. For many of you, this is math that you can do in your head. But there is an accepted way to represent this mass by difference. No, oh, no. 
all. Please no. Go away. There is an accepted way to represent this mass by difference calculation. And this is how to do it. And guys, understand, you don't have the freedom to do this the way that feels best to you. As a scientist, there are conventions that we have to adhere to. We don't make the rules, but we have to follow them. This is the only way to represent this calculation. It goes like this. In order to find the mass of the salt, we need to subtract the mass of the beaker. Because this is the beaker and the salt. If we subtract the beaker, we get the salt. Here's how to do this. Do this with mass beaker and salt. So that's the first number that we're going to work with, the mass of the beaker and the salt. From that, we're going to subtract the mass of the beaker. That will leave us with the mass of the salt, which is the same as NaCl. You're going to set this up first. Notice that this comes first. We haven't done any math. Then what we do is we allow our eye to read to the right, and we say, mass of beaker and salt, that would be 32.76 grams. Notice that we've left some space, but it's on the same line. It's not sloping up. It's not sloping down. It's lined up horizontally. Then we need the mass of the beaker. We're going to line up decimal places. From that, we are going to subtract 31.63 grams. Notice that those also line up well. And then, guys, finally we do the math. 1.13 grams, and that is the mass of our salt. Again, guys, this is the way we're going to do these calculations. No excuses, no shortcuts, no freedom of expression. This is the way these work. Okay, so now we need to move on past this idea. There's the chance that my board is going to freak out or it's going to draw dots. Hey, here we go. All right, gang, now we need to bring this idea, these ideas that we've been mucking with about significant digits and we need to bring them to bear mathematically. Currently, you know two things. You know how to identify significant digits, and you know how to round to significant digits. Now we need to do it in a mathematical setting. So guys, the rules are these. When you multiply or divide and or, the rule is this. You get as many significant digits as you, in your answer as the least accurate number in your calculation. Or I'm sorry, the least accurate, yeah, number in the calculation. Now guys, when we add and subtract, well here, let's do the example. So um, write this down with me if you would, or maybe it's already there, I'm not exactly sure. But guys, the first thing that I would encourage us to do is let's identify how many significant digits are in these numbers. I'm gonna write them down just so we're clear. So guys, remember final zeros after the decimal are significant. So this number represents five significant digits. This number represents two significant digits. Now, if you got your calculator accessible, you are certainly welcome to do the math. But when we do the math, we arrive at this number. But now let's check significant digits. And guys, when we look at significant digits, we see that this number has got five significant digits. And that's not okay. It can only have as many significant digits as the least accurate number. And guys, the least accurate number has two. So there's one digit, there's two digits, the next eight tells us to round up, and this number rounded up to two significant digits is 290 grams. That is the answer to this calculation. That is how we use significant digits. The idea is that the answer can't be more accurate than the least accurate measurement. Okay, so what about in the context 
of addition and subtraction. Guys, significant digits do not matter. Uh oh. Significant digits do not matter in addition and subtraction. Decimal places do. So let me show you. Same numbers, but now we're subtracting. So now we need to count decimal places. Here, obviously, we have two decimal places. Here we have one decimal place. Now, guys, we do the subtraction and we arrive at this number. So we've got 0 minus 0, 0, 5 minus, you get the idea. But we only get as many decimal places as the fewest decimal places in the setup, and that would be 1. That means the answer only gets one decimal place, and that would be 123.2. Because again, you're learning about so many little details. Guys, chemistry is a very, very detail-oriented subject. Right now, it may feel overwhelming. You're like, oh my gosh, we've got zeros and transferring and folding paper and lighting fires and now all of this mathematical stuff. Because these are things that we want you to grow into over time. We don't expect you to do it perfectly, but we expect you to demonstrate that you realize there is a perfect way to do it. Okay, so now guys, one last thing, and uh, that, that will be our time together. So guys, when we collect data in lab, we've talked about the idea of significant digits and accuracy, but we actually measure accuracy. And when we measure accuracy, we call it percent error. You have the equation in front of you, so I'll just give it to you. Guys, percent error is this. It is measured minus accepted. We'll tell you what that means in a minute. Divided by accepted. But guys, let's make sure we see this. These lines right here are not just vertical parentheses. Mathematically, they mean absolute value. And hopefully you know that means just not negative. And then, of course, as it says on your paper, this is multiplied by 100. So what do measured and accepted mean? Well, guys, these are the definitions. Your measured value is the value that you measured or calculated. Some people call it the experimental value. This is the number you're checking the accuracy or the correctness of. The accepted value is the correct answer. So really what you're doing is you're comparing what you did get with what you should have got. Then you're dividing by what you should have got. Here, let me do that rather than pointing with the pen. You're taking what you, you got. This is your number. You're comparing it with what you should have got. And you're doing that by subtraction, which means you're finding the distance between what you did and what you should have did. <laughs> then you're going to divide. Whoa! You're going to divide by what you should have got and then multiply by 100. So let's look at an example. And it goes, oops. Come on, little fella. Hey, there we go. It goes like this. This is really what you're going to do in lab next time. It says, in lab next time, you expect to collect 1.03 grams of salt. At the end of the lab, you only collect 0.78 grams of salt. What is your percent error? So guys, in order to solve this, let's start by writing down our equations. Our equation. So guys, for some of you are like, do we have to write down equations? Yeah, every time, no excuses, no apologies. Every time. We believe in doing quality work, and quality work means not cutting corners. We're going to write down equations every time. Then, guys, from there, we need to move along, and we need to work through this calculation. So the first thing that we need is our measured amount. How much salt did we actually get? And the answer is right here. We actually got 0.78 grams of salt. So we're going to rewrite our equal sign. Um, we understand the percent error is equal to. And our measured amount 
and give myself a little space to work. Our measured amount is 0 0.078 grams of NaCl. Now we need to know our accepted amount. How much salt did we, or I'm sorry, how much salt should we have received? Well, guys, we expected to get 1.03 grams of salt. That is our accepted value. So minus 1.03 grams of salt. Then, guys, that is also the denominator of our fraction, 1.03 grams of salt. And then all of that will be multiplied by 100. You'll notice that I left off the absolute value bars. Let's throw those in as well. Now, gang, this is where you've got to be super careful. Just a moment ago, we talked about the rules for rounding for addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. So, thinking about order of operations, we start in the numerator. This is a subtraction. So I'm going to switch colors so it stands out. But guys, details, right? When we do subtraction, it's decimal places. Here we have two decimal places. Here we have two decimal places. So we get two decimal places in our answer. If one of them was smaller, that's what we would get. But it's two and two. So we're going to go 0.78 minus 1.03. And I get negative 0 0.250. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to ditch the negative. And that's going to be 0.25 grams of NaCl. Notice that we've got two decimal places, and we drop the negative. Now this is still divided by 1.03 grams of NaCl, and then it's times 100. Now we can finish the math. So we're going to go 0.25 divided by 1.03 times 100. And guys, folks, I get this. 24.272%. But now we need to talk. We need to switch colors again so this stands out. We just did a division. And division, significant digits matter. So here we have two significant digits. Down here we have three because the zero is trapped. So we have two on top, three on the bottom. We get the fewest significant digits, which gives us two. Here's one digit. Here's the next digit. The two tells us to round down. And the answer to this is 24%. Now, guys, again, lots of details. Lots of things to keep track of. Some of you are just hugely detail-oriented people, and you're like, this feels good in my heart. Some of you are right now going, you got to be kidding me. I can barely keep my bed made. Mm -hmm. Guys, if that's the case, we are not going to lower our standards. We're going to call you up. Guys, these details matter. Detail matters. And so we are going to support and encourage and hold you accountable for the details. So this is what we're going to do for the rest of our day. Um, in your homework packet, we have assignment uh, number two. Assignment number two on the front is um, all about calculating percent error. Then on the back, there are a host of questions about the techniques and skills and things that you learned. So, Miss Call, we didn't talk about this. Let's see if she's grumpy. <laughs> so, guys, there are 7% error calculations. How many of them do we want them to do um, in order to be able to say that they've done it completely? Miss Call's telling me all seven. <laughs> no, Miss Call, no, please no. <laughs> four? Four? I'm good with four. All right, we're going four. Guys, do the first four of these. So, in order for you to fairly say yes, 
done completely, questions answered, you've got to be gold on the first four. The rest of them can then be practice, your call. Then on the back, we're going to answer all of these, and we will get together next time. We will review this homework assignment, and then, guys, you're going to lab for the first time in your life, and it's going to be... <laughs> it's going to be a good, good thing. So, guys, let's uh, let's now transition into our new context. We're no longer teacher directed. We are now in a student directed work time. You are welcome to work with the person closest to you, next to you, not moving around, not going to other places. That person next to you in hushed voices. The answers will be on the wall or um, they're also available online. So guys, dig in. Let's get some good work done. If you have questions, please ask the person next to you and then your teacher. And uh, let's, let's see how much of this we can get done today.